So welcome everybody. This is Steve Cady, and I'm at Bowling Green State University. And sitting here in my office, we uh, have a variety of things happening today on campus. And I'm here for various meetings. Going to head right out from this one into another one. And uh, our sponsor is Bowling Green State University, who supports me in doing all this uh, long distance or distance education and webinars and all kinds of things that help us connect using technology. So I'm really grateful for that. The Nexus for Change is an organization connected to the Change Handbook. Change Handbook is a book I worked with uh, Peggy Holman and Tom Devane on, and it outlines the best methods from around the world for uh, collaboration on a small and large scale. And in the course of doing that, the Nexus for Change became a uh, a gathering place for all these people doing great work around the world. And so you can see all these webinars and meet people and get resources and so forth. And the topic today is the art of conceptualization. And I think what's what's really key here is conceptualizing is something that we do all the time, and particularly in the work that all of you are doing. Um, you are helping others. You're trying to find ways to help others. And as you help one person, and you help another person, you might begin to realize that there's some things that you would like to save time with the third person. And that is you've got to conceptualize your process, the, the thing that you're doing with them that helps them. You have this thing that's made the difference. And the third person says, can you help me through that? And you're thinking, how can I streamline the process? A lot of people call that scale it or scalability so that I can share it with the next person in a quicker time, get them to a better place and so that we can go deeper and further with them and help them get what they need sooner and in a more profound way. So models are really that. And we're going to talk about how to build models that work. And, and I think it's key here is, is the notion that work. And that is that models that people can use, models that can be put to work and that can help people. And so again, my name is Steve Cady, and I'm really glad you all are here. And the purpose today, as I mentioned, is is around these models. And I think, you know, what are the possibilities for you to take your idea and, and move it to action, move it to a place to improve your personal success, the personal success of others, and the organization's success? We'll talk about, in this session, we're going to talk about types of models and a framework for thinking about it. It's going to be a pretty technical session today. I'm going to get into a lot of, of construct development. Uh, uh, definitions or, or ways of approaching the development of constructs. Um, we're going to talk about uh, styles of learning and how that's impacted by the various ways we present information in our models. We're going to talk about the elements and the items that, that go into our models. And we're going to talk about metaphors and images and how it complements and how we take and build a model that is accessible to others. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, as we go. I talked about this question. We have people from Europe and people from the United States and welcome everybody. And I love to reach out to more people around the world. And so we use three o'clock um, at, at Eastern Standard Time as a time that's most accessible to most accessible to people in the East and the West. We also ask this question. We have lots of uh, people that are practitioners. We have leaders. We have educators. We have students. And welcome again, everybody, for being here. We talked about what intrigues you about today's session. And so in the chat room, I was asking people to tell me a little bit about what intrigues them. And, and so we've got John and JJ, so welcome. And I might, um, let me start with JJ, um, if you're willing. What, do you, what intrigues you about today's session and what questions do you bring? What I'm most interested in, um, first off, hi everyone. Um, what I'm most interested in is um, being able to turn a, um, an idea uh, into something that's easily communicated. So the aspect of the metaphor is very crucial to me and I have a metaphor that speaks to me. The, the real question is does it, does it speak to a wide enough variety of people that it's also useful to them? Great. And uh, John Spaulding, what are you seeing out there in chat land? that uh, people are saying about what intrigues them and what question they bring. Yeah, in chat land, um, Sherry wants to know how to make change relevant and actionable. Uh, Jeff wants to know, um, in terms of model development or this session, how to promote principles of change management as a strategy to ensure technology acceptance. Um, G Broadwater is looking to help administration take bold steps towards real change, so possibly um, a discussion around getting that in included in today. Um, 
Kate is hoping to get some clarity on models. Uh, she's currently trying to get through Burke's organization change theory and practice. Um, let's see, then there are some, I think that's it for as far as uh, the questions that they brought. Great. And, you know, one of the things that I think we'll talk about here um, is the, let me go back here. I'm going to switch over to the slides for the session. And one of the things I want to talk about, and that's a really good question about how, what was, go back to that one, John, if you could, the one around, yep. uh, the, it was just the recent one around, it's almost like sharing or selling the idea or making, yeah, yeah. helping make change happen. Yeah, it was from, well, there's a couple like that, but Jeff uh, wants to know how to promote principles of change management as a strategy to ensure technology acceptance. And then G. Broadwater said, helping administration take bold steps towards real change. Right. And so that the key that's where this work comes in the hand with it comes into play with the notion of building models. A model has got to, as as uh, has been said here, an, an often used quote is there's nothing so practical as a good theory. And there's really nothing so practical as a good model. And the idea is to make your model accessible so the person may choose how to interact with it. I often think that we bring these solutions to leaders, to groups of people, and bring frameworks, roadmaps, uh, whatever it might be, architecture. We bring it to people. We present it to them in a way that they can't understand it. So even if it's the best idea in the world and it will save their life, save the organization or something, and we have an idea that is not able to be understood, the idea gets thrown out even if it is the best solution. And so what I think is really important, and I love the notion of accessibility, then Kathy Dana Miller uh, really emphasized this, is, is how do we make what we're doing accessible to others and help people feel smart? And that's the challenge because we can take something very complex, simplify it, present it. People can interact and choose to buy it, choose to adopt it, choose to help improve it, make it better so that they can be more of their own, like a nice, finely tailored um, outfit. You might get it, put it on. It's beautiful. Put it on. It needs to be tweaked. And yet we bring something forward to people as a model that can be tweaked, uh, customized, as I'll talk about in a minute, to make it even more of their own. So this idea of making something accessible is really important and feeling smarter, feeling empowered. And, you know, when JJ, when you were talking about your model and, and one of the suggestions I'd have for you is, is utilizing a focus group, utilizing your own personal model design team. And I find that there's two things to do that really help me in taking my idea and my methodology and making it concrete or concretizing it, as people will often say, is is I'll start building that and then I'll build it and build it and and then I'll have my design team help me and they'll interact with me. And what they'll do is they will be a great sounding board and they'll help me make sure it's accessible. They'll help me make sure it helps people to feel smarter and they'll help me simplify it so that they can understand it and it becomes practical practical in a way that they can see themselves using it. And so I would encourage you, JJ, to find that group. And what I often do, and uh, Sherry and I talked about this, who Sherry is here and she's in the chat room. She can talk a little bit about what she did with her approach uh, when she built her, her model as a part of a class that we teach here at Bowling Green State University. And that was, we, I said, get somebody to interview you. Have someone sit down that's really good at asking questions, that knows how to dive in and dig in and, 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 and really get them to talk through and ask you questions. Tape record it. And by the time you're done, you will have so much good information. You transcribe it. You'll just be moving that stuff in, moving that information in, and, and flowing it into a really nice model. And this is an art. And I often use this notion. We talk about swimming in the goo. Swimming in the goo is a very important element to any creative process, particularly tapping your passion and connecting your passion to, to a model that others can benefit from. Anybody who has a passion, something that you care to pursue with your life, it is fundamentally rooted in being of service to others. It's fundamentally rooted in helping the lives of others be better. And if that's the case, what you want to be able to do is find a way to connect that inner passion 
to an outward expression in a way that you're motivated, but others are also motivated as well. And that's how you bring your passion to life through creating your model. Now, the modeling change, the foundation, it really began as a simple idea. And this started back in 1996, almost 20 years ago, when I walked in after being finished with a PhD program, I walked into a classroom with a whole bunch of students, graduate students, dropped a bunch of books on a table and said, how do we make sense of all of this? And out of that process, it began to emerge that everybody has something they care about and everybody has the desire to make what they do more accessible to others, more compelling to others. And they, they are struggling with how do I articulate this? And again, swimming in the goo is a natural and necessary part of that process. It becomes an endless journey of swimming in the goo, meandering around, looking at what might be irrelevant and relevant and just pondering. Uh, the, you've heard the, the whole notion of giving downtime, uh, giving space. You can't create something that really matters like in a cram session. You've got to dive in, wrestle, push your brain like you're against the wall, like your brain's just at the wall, at the wall, like almost like a, a large piece of cellophane and you're pushing, pushing, pushing. And then you got to go away, come back and push, push, push and go away and come back, experience some things. And before long, you begin to make your idea become real. And what I learned in the course of the last almost 20 years is that people are all struggling with that themselves and it's an endless journey. And once you've gone through the journey, the cycle wants, it becomes easier to go through it again and again and again. And so how did we figure out, like how, how do we streamline this, this experience of, of building our own models? Well, first study hundreds of models, look at thousands of models, look at how people have created models, look at the ones that you like, look at the ones that your, your, your design team, your own personal model design team, look at the ones that they love. Talk to the experts and talk to people that are doing it, have built it, people that have been successful at doing it. Um, look at the history of people that have built models and concepts, look at what tools are out there that are that are helping people to conceptualize and, and to be more creative and, and so forth. Talk to all these experts, talk to all these different people, look at what people are doing. And, and then also, and these are things that I've done, is start working with organizations. And I start working with organizations and trying out different models and, and, and looking at how models are accepted and, and adopted and, and, and helping them build their own models. And then I've worked with hundreds of executives, hundreds of master's organization development students in our program. We would throw ideas into the pit, throw them in, wrestle with them, talk about them, come back out, throw them in, iteratively going through and through and back and forth. And, it, and out of that emerged a process for crafting a model about something that each of us individually cares about, that we can bring out to the world, that the world can interact with, understand and interact with, and make a a free will choice to adopt, utilize, and be successful with. And then others can do the same. One of my best, best examples is Juanita Brown and David Isaac's World Cafe model. Juanita and David sitting in a, sitting in a, uh, um, or actually sitting outside and it began to rain and they're with a whole bunch of people coming together to talk about things and as it began to rain they had to come inside the house and as they came inside the house they had to figure out where people were sitting and so people started sitting in small little groups and then they throw out a question and they threw out another question and then they said well we want people talking and mingling so got them up and moving around by the time they were done they said something special just happened here and it became juanita's dissertation and then as they began to work the dissertation became something that people tried out. And before long, you got a, a couple of uh, uh, papers and a couple principles and some design features. And before long, you got people reading it and off and doing it themselves. And so I think that's the real energizing thing about each of you and what your work is, is once you make it accessible and once you connect it to what you know works, it's so much fun to watch others. It's so rewarding to watch others bring it into their own world. So let's look at the notion first of generic versus applied models. A generic model is what I've been referring to a lot, and that is a generic model here, as it says, transform, transforming systems from generic models or a white paper or something that represents your model is particularly hard application, is a particularly hard application. Problem, 
because both the system and the models to be customized are highly complex, whereas models have to be generic in order to fit the characteristics of a variety of systems. So you get that. So what you're trying to do with your model is have, one, have it be generic enough that it can be adopted and utilized by a variety of people in a variety of places. And so they and, and so fit the characteristics of a variety of systems. They also have to be system specific in order to discriminate the system undergoing the transformation from other systems and from its environment. So all of a sudden you bring it into the system and it has to be adapted. And there you begin to start getting into the application. And this, this situation describes a typical dilemma that all system transformations have to cope with. So you got your generic. How do you bring it in and help it be unique enough? I can't tell you, and most of you out there probably have experienced this yourself, where you're working with um, a client and you'll talk to them about an approach to bringing, let's take World Cafe into their organization. They'll say, hey, you know what? That looks really cool. But you've worked mostly in... Uh, nonprofits, and that really won't work in for-profit organizations. Or then you'll be in a for-profit organization. You, say, you know what? And you go to a nonprofit, and you'll be talking to them. And they'll say, you know what? I've seen that you've worked with a lot of for-profit organizations. I'm not sure if that'll work in nonprofit, or it will probably work better over there, in the larger organization, in the over there, in the smaller organization. So there's this notion that everybody feels that they are unique and they're special. And so how do you take your generic model and get it to become an applied model? So two types, generic applied. So in summarizing what I've just shared with you, general models, generic models have a general notion to them, whereas applied models become more specific. Generic models are more theoretical. It's, it's a theory of how you think things will operate, and when applied, it should have certain results, whereas an applied model is tested. Uh, generic models are stable. It's, you write about it. It looks, it lo you know, you, you present it multiple times. You might tweak it here and there, but it has a more stable feature to it. When you apply it, it definitely gets changed. It becomes more dynamic and, and becomes more, um, as shown down below, customized. So a generic model is developed, you create it, you write about it, you present it, whereas an applied model is adapted. A generic model is broad, whereas an applied model is more specific or customized. And a, a generic model is a lens. It's a way of looking at change. Your model is going to be a way of looking at it and a way of, of giving people a way to look at it themselves. And if it works for them, it's accessible, and they look through the lens and it makes sense, they're going to likely adopt it for their object, for their situation, for their target that they are focusing on. Um, so let's pause, and I'm, I'm going to see what questions are out there. JJ, what's, I see you have a question. So, so share with, or you, I see a comment there. Um, so JJ, why don't you um, share with me what questions do you have? We also have Jeremy Grandstaff. He's an alumnus from our program, and he may have a couple questions. So I'll start with JJ, then I'll talk to Jeremy. And then John, I'll come to you, and I'll ask you what's out there in chat land in terms of what questions do people have right now as they're thinking about what we've been talking about. JJ? Well, it, it makes a lot of sense what you're talking about. Um, uh, I guess the trick is, do you try to be one or the other, or do you try to split the difference in balancing both the generic model and the applied model so that there's um, there's customizability, yet it fits specific settings? It's both. You, uh, the best models are generic in nature and then applied, and then that's where you see, for example, You've got like a good one is Peter Block's Flawless Consulting book. He also has a Flawless Consulting field book. Um, a lot of times you'll see people create a book and then a field book or a workbook that goes along with the main book. I have a friend of mine who does a thing on does a um, has a book on bullying. And he's now got a workbook on bullying. So it's really both, and they inform each other. And so. And even the creation process is an interesting aspect. We'll talk about it in a second because it's a little bit of both because it's deductive and, and inductive. And what's really interesting is most people build their models inductively and then go out in the world and try to share it to the world inductively. And the world gets bored very fast because the way in which you created your model is not the way in which you want to share your model. And I'll talk about that in just a second as well. Um, 
Steve. Jeremy, how about you? This is John. Hey, John. Can you go back to the previous slide? There's a request uh, to bring that back up. Yeah. So yeah, is there, is there a question about that slide? Not yet, but we'll see. Okay, and as everybody knows, it'll be recorded so they can come back to the recording and see some of these. So, Jeremy, how about you? What questions do you have? You know, I, I've, been, I've been really sitting here trying to think of a question, and I'm not sure that I have a question, but I, I love some of the stuff that you've been talking about. And one of the things, just going back to JJ's question, um, I, I try to, especially when I'm practicing models with a client, sometimes they they need to understand the model, but talking to them as as this is the model and this is what it does is hard for them. And so being able to get at where the lack of understanding is and how you can almost, using their own words, help them see how the model will help them. Correct. So it's, it, it, yeah, and... And that's what's sticking out to me just from listening to the first part of your conversation is one of the things that I noticed as I look back over the last 12 years that I've been doing this work, at the beginning of doing it, I was afraid to test my model. And as I got more experience, it became very clear to me that if my model was based on success of other models or theories, being able to be the one in the room who says, I trust the model is so critical to actually getting the client to trust the model. And once I did that, boom, I actually became more confident in the models that I was using, and, and my, my clients, as a result, became more confident in trusting me to lead them through that process. Right so on. Those are just a couple comments that stick out to me from the first part. Awesome. That's, that's a great – I got a story I want to share with you all that is one of my favorite stories. And some of you will love this to do a lot of independent consulting. And you, you got a pitch and you always wonder and you don't know what happens and if you're going to get selected or whatnot. So I'm at Chrysler and, and I go into Chrysler to talk about um, how to help them build transformational capabilities or change capabilities built on the foundations of organization development and so forth and collaboration. And so as I'm talking with them, there's a model, a formula that I love, and many of you are familiar with it, DVF. Um, greater than R, D times V times F greater than R. And so in talking with them, I tried, I shared with them that, and I have a version of it I use now called DVFS greater than R. And uh, so I walk them through this model, and it, it essentially says that you have to have a, a common database of dissatisfaction multiplied times a compelling ennobling vision, V, of what you yearn for. Multiply that times first steps, concrete actions to take in the very short term, like in the next three weeks to three months, to move you on that vision. And then I've added in the supporting mechanisms to ensure follow through and, and, and long term sustainability of the project. It must, the product of those three, the DVF is what I shared with them, must be greater than R, the resistance to change, in order to create real transformation in an organization. And so I laid that out for them as I was talking with them and talked about how the program that I could do for them could help them build those capabilities around those areas. And, and I, they said, they had, they said, thank you. We have a couple other people. I think at the beginning, they said, we have a couple other people that will be coming in. One person's already come, another will be coming in and so forth. And so I said, thank you. Great. And so as I, I walked out and I'm getting in my car down in the parking lot, all of a sudden someone says, Steve, Steve, Steve. And I said, yeah, could you come back in, please? We'd like you to meet our, our executive, our director of our department. I said, sure. So I came back in and met the person. They brought me in a room and said, you know what? We'd like to hire you. We, we, we like what you're doing. We think what you can do will help us. It speaks to us. Now, that model, that DVF model, was created by a bunch of people. If you search on it, you'll see all kinds of people all over the world. It's almost got a mythological uh, um, story behind it or a mythological aura around it. And what's interesting is the reason it does is because it was built by people over time iterations in practice, and then somebody conceptually brought it together, and it speaks to people. So that's a, that's that's an example of how powerful uh, a, a model can be. Now, John, is there anything else? I'm going to talk about this in just a second. Is there anything else, John, any question out there that I need to address right now, John? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, Marilyn's, uh, well, actually not questions. Um, Marilyn noted that people are inspired to understand different things. Um, 
in such a different way. And so she's asking, is it is it good to have several options um, or several models for the same idea that you want to bring to an organization? Mm -hmm. um, That's a good one. I, and let me let me just let me jump on that one and say the yep. the answer to that is what I call the three V's. Uh, and the three V's go back to learning styles and the way people interact with information and uh, an actual uh, looking at self-efficacy theory and how people build their own personal efficacy. The three V's are, are verbal, visual, and visceral. And I'll be talking about that in this session. So you're right. You, you need to attach the uh, address those different learning styles in, in, as you paint the overall picture. Or not even painting the picture because that's visual. As you build a model that is accessible. What else, John? I, and Steve, this is Jeremy. I just want to piggyback on that while John's getting the next question. I think it's it's also so important to be able to stop. And I'm going to totally credit Kathy for this insight into my work. Uh, you mentioned Kathy earlier. It's so critical sometimes to just stop and say, where are you at? Do you, do you get where we're trying to go? Do you have questions? What do I need to do better to make it more accessible to you? And right. sometimes I've actually found that they will actually, they'll be like, you know, I lost you here. Can you go back over this? And when you do it, they'll, they'll get it. It turns on the light bulb, if you will. Right, right on. John, anything else? Yep, there's a couple more. Uh, Tim asks, can you talk more about how to move from the left column to the right column? Yep. Being from theoretical to applied uh, for a few of the key items. Yep. And that's this model right here. And so as you think about, and, and in one sense, this is a little bit flipped in terms of generic to applied. Um, because applied is on the left and generic is on the right. I can almost move it. But the real experience of life is from left to right. Um, in the way I'm presenting this and that you'll have a phenomenon and a phenomenon is everything from, well, there's clouds, there's water, rain. What is it? What causes that to happen? And so you have this experience with it and you look at symptoms and symptoms are data. And so you're looking at all these things, but it's, 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 it's the experience of life that you're having. You're in with a client and you're trying to address this transformational challenge and you're having an experience with them and there's symptoms and there's other issues and things and data going on. And you have one and then you have another and then you have another and then you have another. And over time, you begin to see patterns in your experience with this phenomenon and these symptoms and these patterns begin to repeat themselves. And as they begin to repeat, you start thinking, you know, I think there's something here that is predictable. And that becomes a theory. A theory is uh, your, your observation about a predictable pattern that is rooted in symptoms, experience, and focused on a phenomenon. So you, you, your model is a theory of how the world operates. Whatever it is that you're, you're passionate about, and you're trying to help others in your service of them, to them, whatever it is, it's your theory of what's going to help make that difference. One thing I won't be able to talk about today are the six design elements that go to go into change various models. And we're talking about model building. Um, I'm going to also do another webinar on those six design elements that go into model building and as you build your theory. But essentially, this will be a nice webinar to set you up for that next one. But essentially, that is the induction. That's inductive side of things. That's how you induction is, 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 is exploratory learning. You're moving from operating problems of management and change to analytical problems of science and daily affairs to understanding those affairs. And so this model building process becomes moving from the left over to the right, because once you have your theory, which is your model, you begin then to you want to research it. You want to test it. You want to look at causes and, and indications and solutions. And you're moving over to the right into a more systematic approach with your your methodology. And so as you move from the left, the induction to the deduction side, you have you move from propositions to hypothesis. 
And so your model is a proposition and your hypothesis are testing out specific elements of it as you apply it and tweak it and, 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 and continuously improve it. And it goes in cycles because you come back to your proposition. You come back to the phenomenon, experience and symptoms and patterns. You have research testing causes, indication solutions and back to the phenomenon. And you come back and forth and you zigzag back and forth in all kinds of kinds of interacting back and forth between the two. And here's what happens. The, the thing that happens out of this is you begin to get into a model building cycle. And what some people do is they get, they get stuck in the cycle going left to right, and they go in a clockwise fashion, if you will, around and around and around. And then you go and you write up your model. And when you go to write it up, what you'll end up doing is you'll start out by helping, taking people through your journey that resulted in how you ended up making this beautiful, amazing cake. And so you, I walk in the room and say, hey, I want to show you some flour. Hey, I want to show you some milk. Hey, I want to show you some of this. Hey, I want to show you some butter and, and sugar. And, I wish you, and I'm like going, okay, what? just wait with me. I'm going to get you there. And I take you through all this stuff. And I take you through all this stuff. And I take you through. And I eventually get to this cake. I go, voila, isn't this amazing? I'm like, could you have started with the cake first? And then told me how. Tell me how you built it. So, you know, and help me learn how to eat it, if you will. Or help me, give me a four, and that kind of stuff. So the, the inductive process by which you built your model, how you experimentally came to the conclusion of a cake or a great margarita or a smoothie or whatever it might be how you present it to the world is different than how you came to invent it so you go from left to right in the creation of your model but you go from right to left in the presentation and description and the story of your model i'll pause there and see if there are any any additional questions is there any questions are there any questions that you have jj uh, Jeremy, uh, this is John. There's a couple other ones out here. Uh, Sherry said she likes the inductive deductive, um, and I think we since she'd like to get some examples of the difference. I think that we you've answered that a little bit. There might be a couple of the things that pop up once you as you hear that question. Um, Jeff said that uh, he he doesn't have time to do his own primary research to create his own model, but he has found success using established models as the basis to, to proof, uh, to drive trust in the model constructor framework that he's promoting. Um, and then there's some discussion in there about the DBS model. Cool. Yeah, and I see yeah. one saying it dates way back. Yeah, it's got a nice history. I'm, I'm working on a paper on that because I, I love the history on that model and how it evolved. And I want to get that out pretty soon as well. Um, so, JJ, any questions or comments at this point? Uh, not at this point. I'm trying to soak up as much as possible. Okay. All right. Well, let me jump in. So you got your model. You've been going through your inductive development, swimming in the goo, as I've talked about, that whole process of exploring, experiencing, and developing, and you're moving into crystallizing, concretizing on the right. You know, that's what that's about. And, and you're going through the process and so forth. And what I found is what I, and what I love is these forms of learning which I call the three V's. And the first one is verbal persuasion. And the next one is visual. And that is vicarious experience, learning by doing, um, learning by seeing, I'm sorry. And then the last one is visceral and active mastery, learning by doing. And so you're going to create a model and a methodology and share it with others in a way that hopefully they get the three V's. And within the context of that, there's this notion of pain and pleasure, which is associated with it. And just like reading a good story, you will feel things as you read it. So we're, you know, as you move people to an actively mastering, you also, and visually uh, vicarious, having vicarious experience or verbal, verbal persuasion, you, you actually will have embedded in all of that, this notion of pain and pleasure. So I'm going to walk you through these three. As I look at the time, we're at 3.40. We're going to be done in 20 minutes. And I'm not going to rush. I may have to come back and pick up and have part two. And you all in the chat room can say, Steve, rush or go ahead and keep going and just let's do part two. And I'll, just, I'll, I'll watch the chat room if you want to tell me what your vote is, so to speak, out there. And let me start with verbal. Verbal persuasion is really learning by definition. 
And so as you build your model, you're going to have these constructs, these variables, if you will. And each of these variables, like in DVFS or DVF, DVF greater than and, and R, they are each variables. And so you got the overall formula and it's got a label. And then you've got the individual elements of that. And so you, you define the overarching one and you define the, each of the pieces and what it is and what it looks like and who interacts with it, how it behaves and why is it important? How do you use it? And so forth. And, and, and even tips and tricks for application and, and so forth. So let's talk about a definition because there's lots of different ways to think about a definition. So, and, and it's, really important to have good definitions because sometimes concepts can have more than one meaning. Sometimes people interpret things in a different way. All the words that you're going to be using most of the times have already been used for other things. So you're going to have to try to create your model and create words and utilize those words and define them in ways that are unique to your model. And the next piece here is really the notion that your definition should be complete enough to include all the items, yet enough to eliminate items that do not belong. So you've got to be able to tell an apple from an orange in the definition. And a lot of times, and I see this, I mean, heck, in just in how people create missions and vision statements, go throw them up on the wall. I can't tell the difference between the two most of the times. And so... You know, I think that's a that's a same challenge we have with creating the definitions in our own models, making sure that the definitions are distinct. Um, and so this is what I'm going to ask you all to bear with me. I'm not big on lots of words, but this is fairly technical, and I want you to have the technical uh, information. And so you can tell me, hey, I, you know, this worked for me or didn't. I'm fine with that because I want to find different ways to help present this information uh, to make it most accessible to you all as well. Definitions will always be imperfect. Your design group is going to help you with that. Uh, you got this notion in here. This is really key here. Good definitions include general classifications of a term plus specific characteristics that differentiate the term from other members of its class. So you see this notion here um, about differentiating. So you want to compare and contrast is what that's getting at. Um, it's thoughtful and accurate. But it doesn't have to be exhaustive because a lot of times we will get writing and you will know it so well. And again, that's where your design team comes in. You'll know it so well that you might be tweaking it and adding so much that it's just too convoluted. You need to find the, the right balance so that it is useful to the people that's reading it. And when they read the definition and they take action based on that, it actually leads to the result that you're trying to achieve with your model. Um, there are road signs and good road signs are never cluttered and they point the way clearly. Six types of definitions. Um, first, logical definition. Second, definition by negation. Third, operational definition. Definition by description, by metaphor, by quotation. We'll talk about each of these. I think what I'm going to do is talk about each of these and then stop. And then what I'll do is... Um, I'll stop and then we'll pick up part two. And based on what I'm seeing here, this might be a three-part webinar. So I, I hope that's okay um, because this is there's a lot of good stuff in here. I'm just reading people saying, take your time, don't rush. Uh, I've shared so I've heard called the Sowater presentations. Of part two can be soon, but otherwise let's take time to soak it in and feel it. Okay, I can do that. I can do it pretty quick next week, the week after. So I can pick right up where we left off. No problem. So thanks, everybody. So let's talk about logical definition. Number one, a logical definition distinguishes an item from others like it. Okay, so think about this. Your idea, your model, you're trying to say it's going to help people improve their lives as a individual, a group, and an organization. And so there's other people trying to do the same thing. And many of you are in a service, and, and we are all in a place of being of service. So competition kind of grates with some people, yet it's a natural characteristic of consulting or even just making a case. Why adopt your approach or why have you help them? Why use this model versus that model? So, so when you think about it, you're going to have to differentiate your model in a way 
that helps them understand why it's unique, yet it's related. So it's it's unique, yet it has some common elements with others, and that's okay. So a beret is a cap that is flat round and usually made of felt. So if you think of a, a beret as one type of a cap, so you can see, so my model is a model that helps people on an individual level, blah, 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 right? So you can say it's a coaching model. So there's your cap. What makes yours unique? Well, how is it different? Plague is a disease. So you got plague, your model is within the family of models that is persistent epidemic. A friend is a person to whom we feel close. So as you think about your model and define your model overall, but each of the individual elements and the pieces of your model, the important thing is, is to help people see that you're talking about the elements and you're talking about the unique nature of each of the elements within the context of things that people can compare with. A friend is a person. Second, you got definition by negation. And this is really helps people to see, um, again, that difference. FM radio is the opposite of AM radio. Chinese is not all at all like English. A friend won't let you down. So it tells you, it tells you what it is not. That's another way of helping your definition to come to life. An operational definition is how it works. A rolling pin is for flattening dough. A Dutch door lets the outside air in, but keeps animals out. A friend will be there when you need her. So what you've got is you got some actions. You can also define it by action or operational. Another is definition by description. And definition by description mentions some of the observable attributes of an item. And so a penguin is a bird with short wings and webbed feet. So you're going to be describing your model or elements of your model. And as you describe a sub element, you could like it, like it said earlier, like we talked about earlier, I, I showed you is you want to be careful not to over define. So you're going to have to, you again, design team, advisors, people that you watch your focus groups, they'll help you figure out how to define it in a way that is relevant and has the observable attributes that are most relevant to them. You know, you've got a clarinet is a long black woodwind instrument with a flare at the end. A friend is someone who really talks to you or with you. So as you can see, those definitions give certain observable attributes in the definition and you've got to pick which ones are most relevant. So definition by metaphor. And that's a figure of speech in which a word or a phrase, meaning one kind of object or idea, is used in place of another to suggest similarity between the two. So a ship plows through the sea. We know that a plow is used in farming. So but when, if you're familiar, so you use metaphors to connect with what people know. And a lot of times when you know your audience and who you're bringing it to, then you can identify which metaphors will be most relevant to them by knowing the language that they're using. And so war is hell. A friend is one's greatest treasure. And so thinking of what are what are the metaphors that speak to others? Now, you might have a metaphor that speaks to you, or you might be trying to be really creative, which I see people do this a lot. We try, we overthink, we try to get really creative in our metaphors because they're catchy or cool, or we want to make sure it has, it, it rhymes or something like that. And we end up creating these metaphors that really don't speak to anybody. I used... Uh, I have a, a project management tool, and, um, and I'm not sure how well it fits here, but the story it kind of gets at the issue. And I had an acronym called POTER, Plan, Purpose. I mean, it, for project management, it was purpose and outcomes and design and so forth. And I'm working with a major client down in Florida in a major development project, and we talked about POTERize, like tenderize, you know, meat, you know, or whatever. And we talked about potarizing stuff and this and that. And one, one day at lunch, the president of the organization said, Steve, I hate potar. I hate it. It's driving me crazy. And I was like, okay, well, what? And he, we talked about it and, and so forth. And I was sitting around kind of noodling and trying to think about what do I do about this and how do we reframe it and make it less, he said, it's long and this and that. And so, I ended up coming up with the acronym PLAN, P 
purpose and outcomes, leadership and who else needs to be involved. A, action steps, and N, needs to get it done. P-L-A-N. Line it up with PMBOK, project, book, project Management Book of Knowledge, and voila, I've got a metaphor, uh, uh, the plan as a plan, and, it's, and it just works. Um, so long story short, I think finding and not overdoing it and really listening again to your design group, which sometimes is your client, which is really important. So let's see here. We're getting almost done and then I'll be wrapping up. Definition by quotation uses the well put words of others to help you define. So old men or children for a second time or ambition, the soldier's virtue or a fool at 40 is a fool indeed. So, you know, using quotes strategically, um, I'm working on a principles of management book, and I love the quote from Alice in Wonderland. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So I have a little video clip of Alice as she walks up to the tree and there's all these signs all over it. And the Cheshire cat's sitting there and she's like, well, which way to go? She goes, I don't care. And so whatever road you pick, if you don't care, Wherever you pick is just fine. So if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And that I use as a beginning part to the strategic planning chapter in the book. And so, you know, a lot of times we can use quotes to help help support or introduce our concept and, and, and make it relevant to other people. And sometimes we use quotes that are relevant to the audience that they care about to bring credibility to it as well. Um, so as we think about definitions and I wrap up here, um, respect your readers. And I've been saying that all along. Somebody tell me polarized stinks to, um, sharing a quote and having people react to it or, or someone gives me a quote or watching people read things and wrestle with it. Um, the main thing is, is you, you want people to feel smart, so you don't want to confuse them. Make sure you listen to your audience and respect your audience and allow them to tell you it's not working. It's not making sense. When someone wrestles and say they hate it, that's my best friend because I know that underneath there's something there. Now, maybe they are a curmudgeon. Maybe they are a downright jerk and they don't like anything. Well, let me tell you what, I'll listen to them and be with them long enough to get my learning, get them to sharpen the saw. But if they're just a downright negative Nelly and I don't like being around them, I'll be around them long enough to get my learning, sharpen my saw, thicken my skin, and then I'll move on and go back to my group that I really respect that that's gives good balanced feedback. But I don't like when someone loves everything. Yet when they love everything, I listen to that and I don't like it when someone hates everything. But again, I listen to it to get what I can. And I make sure I get in the middle with people who have a good balanced perspective and care. And I listen to all of them, have respect for them and, and utilize that to help make me better. Because the whole goal here is you each and every one of you have something very special to offer the world. You're here today because you have a model, you have something, you have a model you want to use and you want to make that difference. And I know because I've been there, we all struggle with how to make it accessible in a way that people understand it and say, you know what, I like it. I think it can help me. And I also struggle with how do I take this thing that I love, make it so concrete that when I look at it, it inspires me to say, you know what, let's take my life to the next level. Maybe I can make a difference in the world. And maybe by just getting that model conceptualized, concretized, scalable enough for me to be able to share it with others, in that experience, I'll walk out more confident in what I want to do in the world. I'll walk out more able to make a difference. So I'm going to wrap up there, see what questions we have. We'll go ahead and have part two, and I'll even probably have to do part three. I hope this has been helpful to you. It's a, it's a start, and it's going to be recorded so that you'll have access to it later. Let me check in with uh, JJ, Jeremy, and then John. If you could, out in, out in chat land, what is your one takeaway from today? And what is your one question you want to see answered next time? What's the one takeaway from today that you found helpful to you? And what's your one question you want to make sure? What are you still curious about? So what was helpful and what are you still curious about? If you could throw that out there in chat land. John, if you could watch 
and I'll start with JJ, move to Jeremy, and then John, and we'll check out, and I'll make sure that you get an invite to the next webinar. Well, Steve, I think uh, my biggest takeaway is the, um, the design team, the focus group, the uh, iterative process of learning how to take the metaphor and make it applicable to the widest um, to the widest selection of individuals you're trying to work with. Um, and as far as a question for next time, um, I don't know yet. I still have to ruminate on um, what I've heard today. Okay. Okay. And you all can always share it with me via offline via email and things like that. Okay. And I want to make sure that I'm staying on point for everybody. Jeremy, how about you? You're on mute, Jeremy. Okay, we might have lost Jeremy. So if he pops back in, that's great. John, how about you? What's your I, takeaway? I was, trouble, I was having trouble getting off mute, Steve. I'm so sorry. Okay, no um, worries. I think my, you know, my takeaway is, my takeaway from today's discussion actually is very much um, around the idea of, uh, it very much follows JJ's, the idea of the design team. And, and I guess for me, I, I always just think it of is, uh, I, I try to do kind of what you're talking about, Steve, when I'm putting a model into practice where I almost have like two or three people that I know are kind of in the middle of the road of what they accept is true about the model we're using. So they're always asking those questions. And then I've always got at least one or two meetings with, you know, the person who loves it and the person who hates it because they usually can tell me uh, the diversity of it and, and whether it's going to work. Um, I think another one, just not to have too many, but the other thing that I would take away is the idea of, of playing to your audience or when I even talk about it with my client, I even talk about how they frame it. And what's really interesting is, is if you use that as a teachable moment in the moment for them and you recognize I'm framing it this way, especially very early in your work with a client, I'm framing it this way in order to be able to do it. Then when you ask them to frame something in a certain way, let's say during a summit or during something like that, they'll do that as well. So it's, I think it's more about getting that work to transfer to the client. Uh, what do I want to learn? God, there's always so much. Um, I don't know yet. Okay. Sorry. Cool. No worries. No worries. John, John, wrap us up. Yeah, I will. Um, there's some great quotes in the chat room, and we will make a copy of that available. Um, Dr. Lynn Bourget started it off. Uh, there was a discussion um, between her and Tim around the use of models and sometimes clients wanting to get to the chase quicker, um, hear about results, um, and making sure that you get that, bit, that verbal impact. Um, so you can capture the people that you're working with. Um, Marilyn said that she would like to um, uh, uh, to know your audience, know what motivates and inspires them, especially when you work across uh, cultures. Um, there's also some discussion about having uh, loving the use of quotes. There's a couple people that like or ha have a takeaway of the inductive to deductive communications or going from the generic to the applied and how important that was. Um, Tim also suggested that perhaps we talk about working cross-culturally. Uh, Jeff said that his takeaway was don't fall in love with your acronym or the model itself. Test it on a 10-year-old to see if it resonates. Um, Dan wants to know, is the application different for small versus large organizations? So possibly we can talk about that next time. Um, Marilyn said models not only understood, but that inspire to action uh, as something for next time. And Janet says, great discussion, looking forward to other sessions, and would like to continue um, on how to meet different client needs. Hey, Steve, there was, there was a comment, this is Jeremy again, there was a comment that was put, I think it was Jeff who said it, about tested on a 10-year-old. Right. And it just reminded me of this, this really interesting concept that I'm going to admit to you, I stole from the cycling and pedestrian advocacy community. And it's um, when they look at infrastructure needs, they create infrastructure that can work for an eight-year-old or an 80-year-old. 
right. and everybody in between. And I've actually really started looking at how do I frame something and could it work for an eight-year-old to an 80-year-old and yep. just kind of trying to play to that concept. So it's very interesting. Test it on a 10-year-old. I, I highly recommend trying it. It's kind of fun. Yeah, great. Well, thanks, everybody. And we will have more. There is – we've just – Scratch the tip of the iceberg because we got verbal, visual, and visceral. So we still have visual and visceral to get into and a little bit more on the verbal and, and just focusing on definition, but we still have a little bit more. Um, so I'm really glad that we've taken our time to go through this. You all will be hearing from us soon and getting an invitation. And my ask is, is invite others to come. I, I really think the better we get at doing this, the better we can all do work in the world. And my passion is helping you and helping others live their passions and make that difference in more compelling ways and more scalable ways. So please invite some other people and anybody can come and uh, love having you all here. Great discussion. Uh, thank you again and uh, take care for now. Bye.